Okay, so uh, I'm Mike Mo. I'm the president of the St. John Center, the RASC, and I'd like to start with an acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Othic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Othic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatakavut and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relations ships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So um, the first thing we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna throw it to Randy for um, some announcements. So Randy, should I stop sharing? Did you need to share? No, I don't need to share. I just point out Her Majesty is right behind me. Uh, okay. As we are a Royal Society, uh, any events of a national nature usually offer a toast to the Queen, but uh, since we aren't doing that, I just wanted to read uh, one simple statement that's, uh, we would like to recognize the historic Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen for 70 years of faithful service. Long may she reign. Okay, thank you. And you had something else you're going to say? No. Nope. Uh, uh, oh, about the magnetometer? Okay, I, I distributed uh, a note to the executive, but uh, there's a uh, project on the go out of uh, which university? Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. And uh, they're interested in expanding the magnetometer uh, network into Upper Labrador Peninsula, I call it Quebec and Labrador. Uh, they're not having any luck finding anybody with a suitable place due to uh, the, the vast number of power lines in that region, Quebec Hydro and, and Churchill Falls and stuff, as well as the heavy snow load. So uh, we, if anybody knows of anybody in Labrador uh, who's willing to participate in that. Ah. Uh, I've got connections with Battle Harbor, uh, which is in Labrador and on an island. Uh, at, uh, so it doesn't have power. So would you, would you like me to uh, see if... Uh, uh, that they, might be what they're looking for. Uh, could be uh, what they're interested in. I'm sure Peter would like another uh, thing to talk about when people come visit Battle Harbor. And, uh, you know, they, they, they're one of the few places that I think still have the Marconi antennas up. Well, you want me to check? Sure. You can hear me. Just, can you? I just thought about that just now because, no, I can't hear you. Uh, you're not hearing me? I can hear you now. That's interesting. Uh, there's, um, somebody has their microphone open and there's some background noise. You might want to just check and see if there's somebody talking background. Okay, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, send him an email, see if he's interested. Okay, thanks. So, um, I, I'm not sure if we've got any visitors, but uh, I'd like to welcome any visitors um, and point out that uh, uh, you're certainly welcome to the, the public meetings. The, uh, our meetings are open to the public, but if you become a member, uh, the benefits include a supportive community, um, access to our, um, uh, let's see, RESC NL talk chat group where people share observations, discuss things, and there's alerts. Um, that's really quite an active group, um, quite interesting. The publications, Sky News, RSC Journal, Observer's Handbook, we're gonna hear a bit about them tonight. Um, low cost equipment rentals, and um, we're hoping that we'll be able to get back to doing member observing sessions sometime in the summer. Um, there's some of the publications. There are um, weekly um, newsletters and um, a monthly bulletin that have lots of inf interesting information. And I'll point out to the members that the General Assembly is coming up in um, 
I guess another week and a bit. And um, it's it's going to be online. It's very cheap for members, twenty dollars. And there are some really uh, interesting looking keynote lectures. Um, I think it's worth it just for uh, some of the keynote lectures, the, the hog lecture and um, Sarah Seeger and some of the other ones. Uh, so I'll just point that out if you haven't already looked at it. You've probably already gotten emails about that. <coughs> and I'll mention that, although I didn't do it just then, um, I may have to mute once in a while. Uh, Cynthia and I had COVID the end of May and we're still, we're pretty much fine, but uh, I may want to mute once in a while while I'm talking tonight. Um, I'll try and remember to do that. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm still hearing an open microphone. Uh, not sure where it is. Anyways, uh, I'll just talk loud. So tonight's presentation, should I go ahead? So tonight's presentation is by me. And uh, it's about two remarkable people, Ruth Northcott and Dora Russell. And the um, sort of motivation for this was uh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, um, we got the announcement that an asteroid had been named after Dora Russell, who is one of the founding members of this center. And so we thought that it'd be nice to uh, have a little bit of a talk to remind people about her. I had never um, met her, didn't know her at all, but uh, I thought I'd like to learn a bit about her. And there's a connection to Ruth Northcott, who um, was an astronomer. Um, and you'll see she did an awful lot with the RESC. She was a pre the president in the 60s. And uh, she passed away in 1969. And we received a telescope that had belonged to her. And that telescope was presented to Dora Russell. So it made sense to me to sort of combine the two of them. So I'm going to talk about both of them. What I'm going to do is close this screen. Uh, okay, I need to stop sharing to do this. Okay, there we are. And bring up this one. And start sharing again. Okay, so. <clears throat> Here's a picture of Ruth Northcott from the 60s and Dora Russell probably from the 50s. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, about them. So I'm going to uh, sort of start with some of the motivation in 1971. Uh, so um, Ruth Northcott died in 1969. And um, one of her telescopes uh, ended up, I guess, uh, with some group at the RESC and Dora Russell made some inquiries and it ended up being delivered to us, presented to um, the St. John Center uh, by Ken Chilton. He was the president of the Hamilton Center. And this is a picture of the telescope as it existed at the time. Um, it's a, a three inch refractor. The focal length is about um, uh, 1200 millimeters. So it had been owned by Ruth Northcott. And so this was a picture of it being presented to Dora Russell, Ken Shulton. So this is kind of where the connection is. I guess, Randy, you took this picture. And so the other, a couple nights ago, I thought, uh, and so this is a picture of the telescope as it exists now. The, the white enamel that was on it originally has been removed, was removed a long time ago, but I set it up outside what used to be the chemistry and physics building. The chemistry's moved out, so I positioned the camera so it just looks like a physics building now. Um, so it's a three-inch re, uh, refractor. It's an alt-azimuth 
uh, mount. You can see that there's this uh, adjustable rod here for the uh, elevation. There's a manual, um, which you may or may not be able to see right there. That was prepared by Brian Payton um, that has a lot of information about it. The telescope was made by a company called Otway in Ealing, England. I expect that became Ealing at some point, um, but it was taken over and the companies were taken over a couple of times. It no longer exists. There's very little in the way of archives, but Brian Payton contacted someone named Kevin Johnson um, at the uh, National Museum of Science and Industry in London, who said that this design was produced from the night from 1904 to 1930s. So it was a very conservative design, um, but they don't really have any record of this particular telescope. And for fun, I tried um, the, the, the eyepieces actually screw into a holder. Um, so I couldn't really attach my camera properly with a, a, a T adapter, but I held the T adapter up to the telescope and took a picture of the uh, um, moon last week. So that's why it's not focused, but it's um, using the eyepieces, it is a nice, nice refractor, but it's very heavy. It's not portable, even though it looks portable. So that telescope belonged to Ru Ruth Northcott. Um, one thing I've noted here is that I think this must have been her sort of outreach telescope. It's not, when I went through what she did, it's not what she used for research, and I don't think it would be suitable for that. So she um, joined the David Dunlop Observ Observatory in 1935 when it first opened. Um, she was essentially a, a research associate at the time, referred to as a computer, but what people like her were doing was basically calculating um, orbits of um, binary stars by hand. Um, you know, so it's, it's real astronomy. It's very um, rigorous and, and difficult work. Uh, she became a lecturer in 1944 um, and taught elementary astronomy and extension courses. She did the uh, undergraduate labs and her research was primarily um, radial velocities of um, binary stars. And she got that by looking at the spectra. And I'll show some papers about that. She was elected to the International Astronomy Union in 1952. So that's sort of a, an important pro professional credential. She also had a very interesting radio astronomy paper. Um, she didn't actually do radio astronomy but she took data from um, someone named Grote Reber and uh, uh, Jansky, who is one of the pioneering radio astronomers. And because she was an astronomer, she was able to convert that data into a radio map. And I'll show that paper later on too. So she um, joined the Toronto Center in 35, was president of that set center, and then um, what's really striking is uh, she worked on the Journal of the RESC from 1951 to her death in 1969 and was editor for more than 10 years. Same thing with the Observer's Handbook, again, editor for more than 10 years. She was the editor of the Centennial Project Astronomy Canada yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And she was, uh, she got a service award in 1967. She was president in 1962 to 1964 and, and other roles in the RASC. And in, um, there was an asteroid name, uh, in, named for her. Um, I missed when the date was when that was done, but it would have been a while ago. So this is the uh, David Dunlop Observatory, the staff in 1939. Um, this is uh, Ruth Northcott. This is Dr. Chant, who was editor of the Observer's Handbook and the Journal of the RESC for 50 years until his death in 1957, which is pretty astounding. And some other famous people here, um, Helen Sawyer Hogg, um, Frank Hogg, um, and uh, this is Jack Hurd here. 
And so I picked out a couple of papers just to show the sort of thing she did. Um, you don't need to read all the words, but her specialty was um, binary stars. So they're orbiting each other. And when a star is coming towards the observer, the spectra all get shifted a little bit to the blue. When it's going away, they get shifted a little bit to the red. So a characteristic of these stars is that all the spectral lines appear as um, doublets, pairs of, of lines. And so she mapped out um, the radial velocity curve. And you'll see a lot of these, because I'm going to go through a few of her papers, not in detail. Um, but the importance of this sort of thing is that this is the information that eventually, along with some other information was needed, but this is what astro astronomers needed to infer masses of stars. So this is really important um, fundamental stuff, very difficult calculations as far as I could tell to do, and um, you know required a lot of lot of precision. So um, to do this, um, you have to do many. Uh, spectra, so in this case, 44 spectrograms over four years. Um, a, they, they were prism spectrographs rather than grading spectrographs. So this was a paper in 1940. Here's one in 1943. So she's got the um, velocities of both um, members of the uh, binary star, uh, 38 plates, um, some information there about the uh, camera. Um, so these were, um, this one was in the journal of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, some of these were in, uh, publications of the David Dunlop Observatory. So they were internal publications, but they would be, um, uh, circulated among the astro astronomical, uh, uh, community papers in the astronomical journal were much more concise, basically just a couple paragraphs, but again, details about the um, how many plates, uh, still using the um, one prism spectrograph. Um, so these are all different binaries that um, she's obtained information from. Um, here's uh, another one. Um, again, this is in the David Dunlop uh, publication. And so this is in the 1950s. Um, this is John Hurd, who uh, I think was also a president of the RESC at one point. And I don't know McCallion, but uh, maybe Chris knows who he is. Um, and so this actually, so this is a paper, a longer paper in the Journal of the RESC with uh, a co-author, Wright. And it, it, the, figure didn't reproduce very well. I got this off of the, the um, uh, ADS, the Astronomical Data System. Um, but these are the spectra that she would be looking at. So she's looking at the black lines here and then using an instrument to convert that uh, into basically a line graph. You can see that these spectral lines are all doubled. And so that's the data that she's getting is the separation between those lines. Basically, one line coming from the star that's coming towards the observer and one line from the star that's moving away. This obviously only works if um, the if we as the observers are looking uh, sort of side on to this uh, binary pair. Um, but that's the kind of data that she was analyzing. Um, she also did a very high velocity star, um, which was apparently much more difficult, um, harder to identify the lines. Um, so that was an important contribution. And then the biggest impact that I could see um, was her work with Gustav Backlos, and I'll say a word about him in a second, um, on a, an eclipsing binary, which is ER um, Vulpaculi, um, and so he's using a 19, um, back off, he's using a 19 inch reflector. Um, 
and first of all looked at it in 1956. And um, there are many citations for this paper. It's this is a fairly short paper, just one page. And then they came back to it um, 11 years later and wrote quite a long paper in the Astronomical Journal. Um, and so now they have a lot more data and they can again plot out this um, velocity curve for the um, two partners in the binary. And um, the interesting thing about this one is that in addition to being um, to being able to see the star coming towards and away, these two stars were lined up in such a way that when one that the star going across in front would eclipse the star behind, so there would actually be a dip in intensity. So this was an eclipsing binary, which is why it got so much attention. There's more information available from this. And this is the sort of thing that um, Chris is going to try and do. Um, those of us who watch the, uh, the, the chat emails, um, this is a project that Chris is working on for exoplanet. So this is the same sort of idea with um, stars, but doing it all with film cameras and um, prism spectrographs. So just a word about Bacos. He was the first astronomer at Waterloo and he died in 1991. Um, so her, uh, he was a collaborator on those two eclipsing binary stars. It was probably a student um, for the first or two eclipsing binary star papers. And he was probably a student for the first paper. So this is the one where she also had a lot of impact. Um, this, this is the radio astronomy paper. So it isn't stuff that uh, she didn't collect the radio data. Um, Jansky was the um, pioneer for radio astronomy. And um, Sander, I'm not familiar with the name, but he also had done some. But the person who actually got the best data was um, Grot Reber, who was an amateur. So he built quite a sophisticated radio telescope. It was in Illinois, but I guess it ended up being um, put in Green Bank, where the big radio telescope was um, before it fell down, but maybe they fixed it. Um, and his was the best radio data. So this is his radio data. And then what um, Northcott and her collaborator Williamson did was take the data, the raw data that um, these three groups, particularly Reber, had generated, and they actually mapped it onto galactic coordinates. And so this was um, the first time this had been done, and this paper had quite a lot of um, impact, and it was published in the Journal of the RASC. So in addition to her research papers, um, she also wrote many, many, and she was the assistant editor from about 1952 to 57, and then the editor from 57 until 1969. So she also wrote um, sort of notes and comments, you know, so a, an article here in 1941 about a comet, um, an article in 1941 about observing Aurora, um, this is interesting. This is 1957. Reading this article, it looks like it was just before Sputnik, but it was talking about what artificial satellites would be all about. So this is kind of introducing the readers of the journal to the idea of artificial satellites and the significance. This was International Geophysical Year. Um, in 1964, when she was president, she, she later on, she wrote a lot of historical articles so this was the inside story of the Observer's Handbook. And to me, the as astounding thing is that Chant was the editor for 50 years um, until 57, and then she was the editor. Um, she was the president in 1964. So these are pictures from the General Assembly in 1964. I got a lot of this stuff off the RESC archives. Um, she kept publishing research papers and contributing articles to the journal. Um, 
1966, she wrote a paper about uh, early accomplishments of amateur astronomers. Uh, so even though she's a professional astronomer, um, a very, uh, you know, very accomplished professional astronomer, she's recognizing the importance of amateur astronomy. Um, and the RESC's Centennial Project was um, a journal or a, a paper, a, or a, a, basically a book. It was an issue of the Journal of the RESC um, dedicated to astronomy in Canada yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Of course, she was the editor and her article was about C.A. Chant, who of course she had worked with quite a bit. Um, and this was the uh, contents page of her copy of the journal with all of the author's signatures except hers because it was her copy, which was a little bit too bad that she didn't sign her copy too, but she didn't. And so this was Ruth Northcott in the 60s, and that's kind of what I found out about Ruth Northcott. Okay, so, and you know, as I said, we, we still have um, what appears to have been her, one of her um, telescopes that she probably used for outreach. And that's what we call the Northcott Telescope. And so then I turned to Dora Russell, um, so she uh, died in 1986, but did a lot of stuff before that. Um, from her obituary, um, she was identified as a, an author, a columnist, a musician, and an amateur astronomer. It's nice that they got that in there. She was one of the founding members of our center. Uh, she got a Queen's Jubilee medal in recognition of her service to the Girl Guides. And in fact, it seems like it was helping Girl Guides with their astronomy badge that got her interest in, in astronomy. Is that right, Randy? Is that just give it, yeah. So Randy's shaking his head, yes. Um, in 1945, she was the first women's editor of the Evening Telegram. And I think she went to the Evening Telegram and said, you need a women's editor. Um, she seemed to be fairly assertive in that way. Um, and there's a, a collection of her uh, columns uh, published in 1983. And in the 60s, she wrote a uh, column called All About Stars for the Telegram. And we'll get to it a little bit later on, but she um, was awarded the RESC Service Award. And it was presented to her by Dorothy Wyatt, um, who was the mayor back in the late 1970s. Um, so this is a picture that I guess Randy took um, yeah. at that presentation. We'll see another picture of the, some uh, people the there. Reason, the reason for the uh, local presentation was that at that time, the uh, service awards were presented at the uh, annual general meeting dinner. So uh, it was quite expensive to travel just for that back then. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So. Uh, and I'm going to invite Randy to jump in whenever he has a comment like that, because we're now getting in, and Gary, I guess, um, we're now getting into where they know more than me. And uh, so please, please just jump in. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, we ended up getting that scope, by the way, was that uh, early on, we had tremendous support from the Toronto Center and they, they paid half and National paid half Dora to attend the General Assembly. And while she was there, she must have uh, struck up conversations with people. And uh, I think the direct result of that was good. we got the telescope after. Yeah, but good, thanks. So these are some of the sources that um, I, I was able to use. Um, this is a book that Cynthia and I were in Piper's a few years ago and in their bin of sort of very extremely random books, we looked and, and said, oh, look at that. And it was basically a, a collection of her writings um, edited by her daughter who sadly passed away recently, including some of her star, um, all about star things, but lots of other stuff. There was a thesis written about her 
1995. And Burt Riggs wrote a Mun Gazette article about her, why isn't Dora Russell better known? And that's a good question. Um, and, and these are all, uh, these two especially, this is a, a Mun Gazette article. You can find it online if you want more information. Um, so from the Burt Riggs article, um, her early days, she was born uh, Dora Oak um, on Change Islands. Uh, came to St. John's, went to Bishop Spencer College and then did teacher training at the normal school, um, which I guess eventually got absorbed into Memorial. She started teaching uh, on the South Side in 1933. She married Ted Russell um, in 1935. And um, then he was working as a magistrate and they traveled around to different places um, Springdale, Harbor Breton, Bond Bay. Um, they ended up back in St. John's in 1943. Um, as I mentioned, she became the first women's editor of the Evening Telegram doing columns and features in fiction. She also covered the National Convention in 1946 and 1947 um, and wrote some in this uh, book. There are some of the columns that she wrote at the time, and she did some of them as dialogues. Um, it was called Spectator or something like that. And they were kind of uh, amusing dialogues between two characters um, arguing about different things, and they were a little bit sarcastic. Um, and she left the telegram in 1949, um, but also did some then some work for the Daily News. Um, as I said, I think her interest in the stars arose from her work with the Girl Guides and her call about um, in the telegram all about stars started in 1959 and ran for about 10 years. And so some of her star columns were reprinted in the Ahead of Her Time collection and some of them are about observing a constellation, how to find things. Some of them are about the underlying um, mythology. So she wrote an article about the Mercury 7 astronauts before any of them had gone into space. Um, some stuff about how to find Antares, uh, how to find Leo, and then some of the stars there, uh, summer solstice. She did some sky this month type columns, um, some mythology, King Cepheus, um, uh, Perseus and Andromeda and Cassiopeia. Um, she had a trip to visit a daughter in Colorado and wrote about that. Um, she wrote about uh, Pegasus and the Andromeda galaxy. And this last one was a little bit snarky. It was apparently um, somebody who kept writing to her claiming to have received mail from outer space. <laughs> And so she finally wrote about mail from outer space. And, and I guess in the end, she said, well, if it, if the mail started in outer space, it would have burned up by the time it got here. But it, it was quite an amusing uh, article. Um, the RESC has, uh, um, uh, in their archives, they have a, uh, a file on Dora Russell. So they've got her bibliography I'm gonna mention in a few minutes. She wrote lots of things for the national newsletter, which I guess is sort of like the bulletin now. And so this was mostly after she had finished doing all about stars in the telegram. Um, they were similar kinds of um, articles for the national newsletter, the RSC national newsletter. Some of them were just notes from Newfoundland um, and some of them were um, you know historical type types of things and it had the information that she um, joined as an unattached member in 1960 and there was a civic reception for her uh, um, service award in 1977 but they also noted 
her Queen's Jubilee medal and a novel that she wrote um, about Newfoundland life. So in going through the archives, um, one of the things I found that was quite interesting was some correspondence between um, her and the secretary of the RSC, and then eventually her and Ruth Northcott. So I did find a letter from Ruth Northcott to her, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it's only in many cases, one side of the correspondence, you have to infer what's going on. But this letter is a letter back to the executive secretary in 1960. So, so she must have written an earlier letter the executive secretary wrote back and then she is writing so this is the third letter i think in the correspondence and it implies that she has asked for RSC membership and the RSC archive says that she was an unattached member in 1960 so that's about right but she says um i am burning with curiosity to know who the second applicant for membership in Newfoundland is. So there was somebody else also applying for RESC membership. Um, and Randy and I were speculating about who that might have been, um, Mr. Woods or somebody, but um, I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, Mike, I, uh, yeah. I found a reference later that Steve Kelland, uh, when he first joined, was not in St. John's. He was out around the bay. So I guess that's before he came into uh, university here. That would be in the late 60s, I would think. Okay. So that's another possibility, another another suspect. Um, she had asked for a list of observatories in Canada. Um, I guess she wanted to write about that in All About Stars. Um, and she also asked for permission to use information from the observer's handbook for her All About Stars um, uh, column. And, oh, and she also asked about whether there were any other magazines or journals that might accept articles about amateur astronomy. And so then, um, so this one is in October, and this, answer, this letter was actually answered by Ruth Northcott. And so this is November, so this would probably would have been the, the response to the letter I just showed you. She provided a list of institutional observatories. Um, she indicated that the Journal of the RESC does include articles from amateurs. Well, that should say from not form. Um, and she encourages the eventual formation of a center in Newfoundland. So this is 1960. Um, you can't read it, but it says, I would certainly be pleased if in the course of time, a center uh, of the society should be formed in Newfoundland. Um, best of success to you in your endeavors. Um, so that's kind of encouragement from Ruth Northcott. And I thought it was kind of nice that the, I found at least one letter that connected um, Dora Russell to Ruth Northcott directly. So, um, from the history um, of our center on our webpage, I found that uh, in 1965, Captain Strong um, wrote to the National Secretary about forming a center. There was an organizational meeting held in 1965 and um, the National RSC Council, I guess, approved the center in 1966. And so that's posted on our website. And Dora Russell was involved um, right from the beginning, just about every year, um, vice president, president, then vice president again, then president again. Um, I think there's one year when she wasn't something and then president again. So she was president three times and something else most other years. Um, oh, and she was, the, the years in between she was, the secretary. Um, so this is a copy of the um, one of the newsletters from 1973 done um, 
uh, mimeographed or gestetner, and uh, most of this appears to be Dora, and um, there's four typewritten pages with points of interest and a handwritten um, drawing of the great hexagon with um, Orion and um, uh, Capella, Pollux, Sirius, I should know, oh, Procyon, and I think, is that, I'm not, can't quite make out what that one is. That's scary. Oh, yeah. Gary what is it? That. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Aldebaran? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so, that was it, done on a, uh, a, a a piece of, uh, well, a pan full of jelly. Gelatin. And you'd put it on, and then you put the next picture on, and you copy it, and you could do 100 copies. And that's how Dora and I did it in my kitchen until I got okay. a Gazetner. Okay, so Gary, this is your drawing. I think that's her drawing. Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I produced the stencils. Um, I remember the uh, that was my style to do a, a hash mark around important things, right? So it was it was somebody who didn't uh, waste any time with a ruler, anyways. Uh, myself and Gary were the newsletter editors back then, and I said if you if you remember the old style. Stetner stencils that you saw in school. Yes, I remember that. A top sheet with a carbon underneath. And when you typed, the carbon came and stuck on the back of the sheet. And usually you put that in the Gestetner spirit duplicator, and uh, the ink that was on the back would rub off and you get copies. I, well, I think I still got that down in my basement. <laughs> or did I throw it out? Before that, you should probably was, get rid of it. Yeah. There was a, a method where you could you do a pan of gelatin. And you stuck the sheet onto the gelatin and it absorbed the ink. Then you pressed on a blank sheet and tore it off, and you get the same as a copy, right? It, it's amazing stuff. I can still remember the smell of those things. Oh, I loved it. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> good stone held by all. <laughs> yep. And so the, the very detailed um, information here about. Uh, mostly about uh, this great hexagon. Um, and there was also a, a, a Y and different shapes and uh, a super dipper. And one of the amusing things at the end, um, even back then there was an observing challenge. The last sentence, the second last sentence is, I'll bet, I'll bet that nobody knows where the star Vindia matrix uh, Vindamia, Vindamiatrix is. Um, that's something for you all to find out. <laughs> so she was exhorting everybody to go out and find that star. So I had to look it up too. Um, but I forget where it is because I got brain fog. Um, but I, I'm afraid that in the archive, so I got this out of the RESC archive. So somehow you can see this is actually the National RSC stamp. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somehow these things made it to the RSC archives, but they're almost, well, they, they are unintelligible. I had to do yeah. a lot of um, stretching to um, bring the contrast out enough to be able to read what's there. But I that have, was fun. I have the original still, I think. I have some of the originals here oh, too. Amazing. Uh, one uh, thing about, about Dora was that when you went out observing, she would pick a constellation, mm -hmm. tell the legend behind it, yeah. tell you, you can see this with your binoculars, this, 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 and then say, all right, point the telescope, and we'd look at them objects. So that's how I learned the sky mm -hmm. by her. She knew the sky for sure. Oh, did she ever. Impressive. Yeah, it's no, pretty no. clear from from all of this stuff that um, you know her her knowledge was pretty deep. So once her column for the um, telegram was ended, uh, she started appearing in this national newsletter. So through the seventies, so here's Kings and Stars. So this is kind of the um, uh, 
some lore about uh, uh, about star names, including the idea that um, uh, uh, a king of England once had a constellation named after him, um, and uh, something about Napoleon. An article here about Vulcan, which was um, speculated to maybe be a, a planet um, between Mercury and um, the sun. And the reason that people speculated about that was that there was a perturbation of Mercury's orbit that couldn't be accounted for with normal Newtonian physics. But it turned out that general relativity did account for that, um, you know, the precession of Mercury. And um, so that was the end of Vulcan. So, you know, fairly sophisticated articles. Um, this was a, a high point um, in the early history of the, uh, of the center, which uh, Randy and Gary can probably say a bit more about. But I guess that Whitburn was the place in the 1970s that was best suited for observing um, a, a double grazing occult occultation of Alcyon and Tegeti um, by the moon. And I guess that if you could observe both of these um, contacts, there was some information you could get. And this fellow, Harold Pavenmeyer and his wife, drove all the way up here from Florida. There's Dora Russell, there's Randy. Um, and they went out to Whitburn to um, watch this occultation. And I guess the first one was clouded out, but the second one um, half an hour later was observed. And there's probably other stories associated with that. They're in the Pleiades, are they not? Yes. And they're one on each side of the moon. So they were hoping to get a, a more precise estimate of the diameter of the moon. Okay, so that's what it was about. Yeah. And I mentioned Steve Kellen. He's the guy on the far left. So he was an early member. As well okay. As Randy Nugent and Ken O'Brien. And uh, of course, Randy Joyce is there as well. I couldn't identify the guy on the far right, Gary. Uh, I thought it was a Ken somebody. May have been a friend of uh, Randy Nugent. Ken Shelton. Uh, no, no, local member. Oh, that's Ken right there. Yeah. Maybe Ken. That's why I put a question mark. Yeah. So um, Dora wrote that up again in the national newsletter. And, um, you know, because that was a fairly big, big deal. St. You know, the St. John Center was the center that was positioned to, to observe that. Um, the interesting thing is that the article just before this one in um, the national newsletter, so the one that I cut off to paste this in, was the amateur astronomer in the 1970s by somebody named Terence Dickinson. So I thought Who's that there? was kind of cool. <laughs> so this one um, I picked out because this is the same style that she used um, when she, in some of her columns about the national convention where she had two characters arguing back and forth um, about uh, confederation and things like that. Um, and she did the same sort of thing here. This is supposed to be uh, the man who uh, discovered the um, moons of Mars, um, sort of going back and forth with his, with his wife. Um, about whether he should be out observing or not. Um, and he eventually does go out and discovers the uh, the moons of, of Mars. So very, sort of a, an amusing uh, little story um, with some uh, historical content in it. Um, so here's notes from Newfoundland. She did this fairly regularly in the um, national newsletter. Uh, so for example, here's something about the uh, planetarium. Um, but this would have been before the Marine Institute, right? 1973? 
Was that that was building? Cod College, College of Fisheries, which so was that the was old down university. The hill. That was down the hill from there. That was uh, right where the uh, on top of uh, Parade the Street. building opposite the Cod College. Oh, Street, okay, yeah. top yeah. of Parade Street. Street. Yeah, got you. Okay, um, she Any mentioned. Portion? She mentioned the uh, Northcott telescope and putting a memorial, <coughs> excuse me, a memorial plaque on there um, and came into our possession through the combined efforts of um, Marie Lachinsky and Ken Shilton. And in 1974, um, she's got a loop. It's the famous uh, poem by uh, Bob, uh, I forget who was the guy who did. Fog on a little cat's feet. Robert Frost. We, we did it in high school. I, anyways, Robert Frost. No, 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 no. Anyways, <laughs> she says this is as good an excuse as any to explain why we've had so few observing sessions this summer. So that sounds familiar. Hmm. Um, so this is her getting the um, uh, service award at the civic uh, reception. So this is a, another picture with Randy, Dora, Peter Alston, Ken O'Brien, Jack Burridge, and David Bennett. Um, this is, which I think Randy must have had a lot to do with because mm -hmm. the letter I found see Randy's fingerprints all over it. Uh, David Bennett was the secretary that year. Jack Burridge is one of the originators or early members. Dr. Kennedy J. O'Brien and uh, Peter Olson. He okay. was back here not long ago. So, uh, and I had hair back then, but a little bit. Indeed. And a, a pretty sharp suit. Yeah. We, we should have a formal meeting. So this okay. was the um, obituary published in the National Newsletter in 1987. Um, for Doris, so she passed away in 1986. Um, and in 2021, uh, uh, an asteroid was named in her honor. And at the same time, um, an asteroid was named for David Chapman, um, who many of us uh, know about from Halifax, and Brian McCullough, who I am not as, I'm not familiar with, but probably Gary and Randy are. And so that's kind of what I came up with. And I, I hope it was interesting. I found it, a, I had a lot of fun sort of going through the archives and digging stuff out. And uh, I thought it was worthwhile exercise. So there we are. Well, I can, I can mention so, um, Gary, Gary might fill in as well. Yeah. So, Please, please jump in with any other recollection you have. Back in the, those, I, I first appeared on the scene in 69, I think, and joined in 70, 1970. <laughs> and uh, we had very few members back then. Uh, we tended to do our own observing, not uh, group sessions, of course, because there weren't very many of us. But remember back then, uh, the skies were a lot darker in town than they are today and uh, Dora lived down on Stony House Street south of uh, Churchill Square area lots and lots of trees so you could uh, there were more stars than you wanted to see you could you could tell constellations very easily because of the number of stars and but said Dora took us by the hand many times to point out stuff in the sky uh, we had uh, some executive meetings because there weren't very many of us at Dora's house and uh, well, she taught us how to do the social side of that gathering, tea and coffee and, uh, <laughs> I know and donuts up. and uh, cookies and stuff, right? Uh, you may not recognize who her husband was, Ted, Ted Russell, Uncle Mose, uh, her daughter, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Miller, you might have recognized from uh, the uh, lady. Uh, she was most known for her uh, Dracula stuff. She was a noted mm -hmm. expert on uh, Dracula so, and her son. Uh, so uh, I don't know if her other, her other kids, uh, but certainly uh, uh, 
Well, Kelly Russell. Russell. Kelly Russell. Kelly uh, Russell, yeah. yeah. He's a fiddler, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember her, she, we were at a meeting and she said, this is my son, Kelly. He's trying to make a go of it uh, down yeah. on George Street playing the yeah. fiddle. He said, but I don't he's, think he's going to do much with it. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was your typical and, and of course, she was a music yeah. teacher too, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to tell the story about the hot dogs. No, the no. eclipse. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> so I, I have a recollection. Okay. Um, that telescope, uh, I remember looking through that telescope probably 40 years ago, 45 years ago. My father was part of the society at the time, mm -hmm. yeah. and he, he brought the telescope home. And I remember looking at Saturn through it. Yeah. And uh, that's John a really Pippen. cool memory. Yeah, that's right. And, and I suspect it was pretty good. Yeah, uh, I was. Because I lasting at, memory. Yeah. I looked at the moon through it, and you know my picture wasn't very good because I mm -hmm. had to just sort of hold the camera up against the end of the telescope, and you know it made it very hard to focus. But when I put the eyepiece in and focused it properly, it was a pretty sharp image mm -hmm. of the moon. Well, three inch refractor. Yeah. Uh, it had a, a glass that, that was solar a, filter. For, <laughs> big back then, buddy. The yep. That was something. I, uh, I have a memory, too. Uh, Ken Charlton, when he came down with the telescope, mm -hmm. he gave us all a copy of his book mm. oh, on a Gazetteer. Can't see it. Oh, yeah. Variable stars okay. yeah. with binoculars. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I can no. get it right there. Let's see. There it is. Oh, sort of. Uh, it's it's hard. Yeah. Okay. You can see it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's about eighty books and the information all on it. So I thought it was kind of thing. Cost me thirty five cents. That was more mm -hmm. than the, you know, eighty book pages of variable stars that you could mm -hmm. see with the binoculars. Start you off. Oh, I still have it. Yeah. We. Uh... <laughs> We used to meet at the Fisheries College, and of course they had the planetarium, so we could use that whenever we wanted. And uh, we had the use of the uh, classrooms. That's where we had our meetings. But uh, back then, of course, you couldn't get any free advertising. If you had anything in the paper, there was no, you know, socials columns. You had to buy an advert, and you know, a little one inch by two inch advert was twenty or thirty dollars back then. You can imagine in 1970 what that was worth. So uh, it was it was tough getting membership. So and, um, Sue just made a point. She said, uh, "Susan's saying I would like to read some of the archival data more carefully, if that is possible." So Susan, it's very easy. Well, you have to do a little bit of searching, but um, I, I can send you the PDF of the slides, and anybody else that that would like them. Um, but oh, if you that go would be the, lovely. Thank you. But if you go to the RESC website um, and search for Dora Russell or yeah. Ruth Northcott, it just takes you right into the archive. They've, they've, mm. at some point, they've must have scanned every scrap of paper that was in the RESC office, yeah. and it's amazing what's in there. And in fact, yeah. I think yeah. there's probably some stuff that's in there that yeah. maybe if it had been me, I would have shredded. Yeah. But, Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth, there's Elizabeth an Miller's awful book. lot of stuff in there. Yeah. Elizabeth yeah. That, has a lot of it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, if you the, can find a copy. The book, um, this, this one here, which again, if you wanted to, Somebody wanted to have a look at this. I could I, uh, thank you, but I would like to get right. back. When uh, when Dora when Dora passed away, uh, Kelly gave me boxes of all of her stuff, including the uh, original script she sent to the Telegram, and I had those, and I gave those to Elizabeth for inclusion in the book, and got them back eventually. So I still have that stuff. Hmm. I one of the things. Anybody who, and both of these people did a lot of writing, and mm. Ruth Northcott did a lot of editing, and 
uh, I can still remember writing because I was writing papers before there were word processors. But to see someone who did as much writing and as much editing as the two of them did yeah. at a time when it was all done with uh, typewriters and yeah. and I can remember doing things on onion skin paper that was erasable, you know, erasable paper. And mm -hmm. um, it's just, I, I can't imagine being able to write something and have it good enough. That's right. And, uh, that and the was a skill, a big the family, skill. The family was still around as well. So don't forget, uh, she was kept yeah. busy uh, when we were there. Kelly was just a young teenager. So Amazing. Anyway, so can you remind me to send that to yeah. Sue? Okay. So Cynthia is going to remind me to send that to Sue. And anybody else that wants to just drop me a line. And, if you can um, find so, a copy of Elizabeth's book, that's a good place to start. Uh, and you probably get them for dirt cheap these days. Uh, I, I found a copy on Amazon of the Book of Doors articles in the telegram, pre-astronomy ones. Uh, what was hmm. that book called? That would be interesting. Uh, I bought it on Amazon, but it was shipped from a, a, a used bookstore in Fredericton. So okay. <laughs> hmm. day by day, I think it was called. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that sounds right. Yeah. And it was the hmm. same sort of format of two people talking back and forth. And it wasn't. Yeah, she used either, that so. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank okay. you very much. So we should probably move on to um, uh, mm -hmm. observations. I'm going to share the screen again. And uh, so uh, I've got um, a, a couple of late entries in the Lunar Eclipse Derby. And so I've got a couple of pictures from uh, Sue. And did you want to say anything about those, Sue? Oh, Sue's. OK. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can see the one on the left is is not focused. I think Robert actually pointed that out to me. And that's one of the challenges I'm going through at the moment, trying to use auto focus and then switch it off and then lock it and everything. But anyway, I guess I will learn how to do that. Um, the settings I use, I, I think anyway, I did have a look this morning uh, today and I hope these are right, but it was one one thousand second shutter speed, uh, f-stop 5.6 and ISO 400. But I started off with something that I picked up from one of the, I think it's either Sky News or Astronomy, which was a much lower ISO than that. Anyway, yeah, it worked okay. Yep. I'm surprised that any of them came out really. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, and uh, then I've got some from Jim, but I'm going to switch to um, PowerPoint. So Jim did two more GIFs, and I'm going to. Uh, oh, let's see. Okay, so this is. One where um, I think it's something happening. There we go. So in this one, uh, Jim, do you want to talk about what's happening here? Sure. Um, yeah, this is the start of the eclipse, and you can see the clouds going over. Um, we're starting off with the penumbral shadow, with, and then as it got, as you can see, the darkness at the edge there, that is the beginning of the umbral um, shadow of the earth. This is, if you were on the moon at, in the dark side there, you would, you, would, uh, you would not be able to see the sun at this point. Um, so as, it, as the umbral shadow, which is the darkest part of the shadow, moves across the moon. Um, um, basically, the, uh, I was adjusting the exposure manually as this was uh, taking place. So as the moon got darker, I. I, I cranked up the uh, the um, the time of the exposure uh, until at the very end I was 
uh, getting uh, during the eclipse itself. Uh, it was getting, um, you know, somewhere on one or two uh, to up to a maximum of 15 seconds uh, during the totality phase. So here it's just basic, and as this GIF is uh, progressing, I I just tweak the the uh, the exposure time there and, and boosted the exposure so that you can see the the reddish glow that that was uh, at um, uh, uh, at totality. Okay, and how about this one? So this is a similar similar, but this is during totality phase at this point and at, th at this point i wasn't tracking uh, i was tracking with respect to the stars so you can see the moon floating with respect to, to the stars and you, you can see in this particular video there's a there's a, a few dozen that you can see uh, on the screen here but there's more than 400 stars in the background there and uh you can just get a sense of the of the light as that's uh, basically being refracted through the earth's atmosphere illuminating now the, this this is actually very very dark at this point, um, so this this these exposures are roughly uh, six to fifteen seconds each. So, and so uh, was was this one one that we saw last month, but you did something different to it this time? Uh, um, I did slightly slightly different. This one is these these uh, gifs are. Um, uh, I think I, I I process them slightly more tastefully. Let's just say that. Okay. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to bail out again. And can I ask a question before yeah. we move on? Um, I was I was just wondering as as I was watching that and seeing how uh, red the moon was, which is obviously um, the light from being refracted around to the Earth's atmosphere. I was just wondering if there was, uh, it, I've never seen an image, but I, I wonder if there is an image of uh, that NASA would have taken uh, during a, uh, an eclipse like that, looking uh, back towards the Earth so that you'd see uh, the sun's corona from an opposite perspective of what we would normally see for a uh, total solar eclipse um the the earth the, the relationship between the size of the earth and you know the the size of the sun is not the same as the relationship between the moon and the sun so you wouldn't see the corona the, the sun would be much smaller looking at the earth with the sun behind it, the sun's much smaller than the earth. So I don't, don't think you would see much of the corona, but what you would see is a red ring yes. around the earth. Yes, right. yes I, knew, I knew the dynamics would be different, but I, you know, I've never seen an image to show what it looks like. Yeah, so I don't know if they've ever, anybody know? Well, the uh, only thing NASA currently has operating in the lunar environment that I know of is the Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory, and it looks down. Um, and uh, China still operates something on the moon, doesn't it? I'm really not sure. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Future I have seen something. Good, good question, but we don't have a good answer. Okay, okay so Robert, um, this is your uh, Dumbbell Nebula. Yeah. And yeah, one of many I've taken over the years, and uh, nothing particularly special about it. Uh, just a uh, uh, refresh of uh, taking an image of the uh, of the dumbbell, I guess. One minute exposure, so it's a single yeah. um, image. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Jim's away. Um, but the this is so uh, Jim Johnson's been doing a lot of um, monochrome uh, shots through uh, in this case H alpha, and this is the Wizard Nebula. So I guess that's the Wizard's face, and that's his his arms coming down here. And 
Jim now has uh, two things going at a time. He's got um, a peer outside his observatory and a peer inside his observatory. And I forget which one is which. Um, and this is uh, the elephant trunk nebula, but it's very, very wide angle. So there's the elephant trunk right there. So it's the elephant trunk nebula with a lot of um, context around. It. Oops, sorry. And the data is underneath there. Um, Chris, here's a couple shots that you did. Uh, yeah. Quick shots uh, towards the end of May, just out in the, the backyard observatory. These are synthetic color um, because I have this big monochrome camera now. And uh, so I have to, in order to make color, I use a filter wheel. And um, I've only used red and green. You see a lot of blue in these, but in making the color composite, I just use a copy of the green mapped with blue. And then I tweak the, the, the chroma and hue a little bit cheat a bit to to make it look full color and these are uh, two uh, two classics of course in the early summer sky and the uh, hercules cluster and the ring nebula things that we, we grew up with so uh, um yeah, i thought they were okay i'm having difficulties flat fielding this thing and that's porch lights going everywhere and the front of the telescope doesn't have a dew shield so but i thought these came out okay is there a way that you could fake the blue by doing um, just luminance and subtracting the red and the green and come up with some sort of algorithm to? Sort of, yes. And that's basically what doing the tweaks in a, something like the Photoshop or in my case, GIMP in Linux. It's basically what the adjusting the hue and chroma is doing. I mean, okay. I should use a, a blue filter but of course, there are things technically in the blue, like H beta and and other things that from a nebula, and certainly some oxygen lines, oxygen two lines, which you which you simply won't see unless you're looking at it with a blue filter. But you know, it's a decent fake. Uh, O3 is green and hydrogen alpha is red, so red and green captures most of it anyway. And um, you know, to 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 admit here, a it's time. You know, why use three filters when you can use two? And b I smudged up my blue filter anyway, so there you go. Okay, so there's two reasons. Yeah. Okay, um, I did a few nights on the Sunflower Galaxy, which I'd never done before. And, um, for me, that's probably as long as I've ever looked at one galaxy, so I had fun with that. Um, a long time. And uh, Robert did the Iris Nebula, and I, flipped it so it'll match another iris nebula we're going to see later on and robert used um a dual band filter red green um so anything more about that robert uh no nothing nothing really more to say about it's uh, beyond remarkable but uh trying to it's, get, a, uh, it's a work in progress it's a very challenging target yeah. Okay. Okay. So this one is a test for um, <laughs> for everybody. This is the soap bubble nebula, and so where is the soap bubble? And I mm. found it once, but um, okay, I found it again. There so, is a hole. So there is the soap bubble. Yeah. Right. Okay, <laughs> it's 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 very round, and it's uh, Jim had also done a um, an earlier picture which was um, not quite as wide field, where you could make it out a little bit better. But there's the soap bubble. I'd never heard of a soap bubble ne nebula. <clears throat> it's interesting, and John Nugent's been making tremendous progress. Yeah. Um, so uh i guess he was out of town john you were out of town when you did these the, yeah that was up to the cabin yeah very nice and uh we have a another pinwheel coming from you at the end so anything yeah. else to say on these or 
Uh, no, that was just my first time shooting out with a, you know a lower portal class, of course. So made a bit of a difference, but I never had much time on it. I only had one night. It was cloudy the rest of that weekend. Yeah, well, very nice. Good work. And this was a uh, an important uh, historical event, uh, you know, Chris. Well, sort of. <laughs> um, we got lots of pictures of it, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Must have been um, important. May may do uh, with the Skyshed pod for a decade, and um, the the pod's roof unfortunately it opens like a like a trash pail or a garbage diaper pail, and yeah, it's it's a wide opening from left to right, but it doesn't allow the telescope to look very high up into the sky. Zenith is blocked, so for a decade I couldn't track anything up to Zenith or even close to it, and that became so frustrating that I bought a next dome from. BC outfit because it was a proper little observatory dome with a shutter that would allow the telescope to look up. And I finally put the thing together on the May 24th weekend when my wife and daughter were in Toronto and they wouldn't be too upset by bits and pieces all over the deck of both the old and new dome. And I had friends visiting for their mother's birthday and they helped me lift this on over the telescope that was on the pier already so we were careful. I took wow. all the bits off the telescope that might get damaged and uh, shifted the building back to where it was in the original. So the telescope is in the middle, and yeah, it seems to be working fine. Totally Very undriven good. at the moment, but if, uh, if, at some point, I'm going to put a motor in it so I don't have to run out every 45 minutes to re rotate the dome. Okay, so great. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, so I, another galaxy i'd never looked at was m106 so i tried it um uh got a little more than an hour on it up uh, one night and uh so it's not that spectacular with uh my telescope but the amusing thing here was when i started looking there were a lot of other galaxies in the picture so i got a kick out of that yeah um Robert got a shot of the teddy bear nebula, which, where's the teddy bear nebula, Robert? <laughs> oh. Around Cassiopeia, isn't it? Okay. Where's the teddy, bear? See a te oh. teddy bear in there? Yeah. Uh, well, teddy bear. I, I think maybe... Uh, Is that know, the head of the teddy bear? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really uh, the, in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> well, maybe down there? Probably ripped, ripped to shreds by a toddler? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the stuffing out of a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be it. Anyways, good work, Robert. Yeah, yeah thanks. And John sent in a uh, <clears throat> lovely shot of a sun halo so that's ice up in the sky mm. and uh so jim Ooh, did a few nice. shots of the iris nebula and uh this was i guess the last uh version of it and um so you want to say a little bit about this one jim this is quite impressive yeah, this is a, a couple of different nights and a couple of different attempts at processing. So um, this was the second attempt at processing and I, I, I merged to, well, these are five minute exposures. So um, I was going after the dust and, and uh, the clouds of dust that are in the background more because it's, a, cause it's mostly a, um, the iris nebula itself is a reflection nebula. That's the blue color you see. But it's the it's the dust colors uh, that are basically just reflected starlight. That's very difficult to bring out, and you have to have uh, many hours of exposure to get that. So this is uh, what is this? This sixty times five, which is uh, three hundred minutes. So that's uh, five hours of, uh, of 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 accumulated time there to get uh, get some some hints of the dust, um, which is what I was going for here. Yeah, that's that's really nice. The 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 dust is really interesting. That's 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 what we're made out of is that stuff. Yeah. That's a New Mexico image taken from East End St. John's, Jim. Congratulations. Yep. Lovely. 
Very good. And Robert, beautiful Veil Nebula. Yes, that one came out uh, quite well. I was surprised myself with uh, with that. I think there's yeah nine three hundred nine uh, forty five minutes in total. I guess nine times yeah. Uh, yeah. five minutes. So uh, came out quite well with uh, the dual band uh, filter, and that makes it. Huge difference, and the veil was pretty high in the sky, almost at zenith, I think. So that makes a, a difference too, certainly, with less atmosphere to uh, get in, in in the way. So that accounts for some of it, perhaps. Yep, very nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all heard about the Tau Herculid meteors, and uh, Gary caught some. You want to say a bit about what we're seeing here, Gary? Uh, the top, the top photo uh, shows one. Uh, the one that is it, is yeah, it that, that one, one there, there is the is the uh, bright uh, meteor. The other two are satellites, and in the other one is that's a single picture. And the other one is a the stack overnight. So what you're seeing is lots of clouds. Hmm. But I want to I circled. I wanted to show you all the little meteors as they head back towards uh, Arcturus. Uh, what they discovered was that the they thought it was in Hercules, but when they did the planning of it uh, for this year, they thought it moved over to Bootes. And as you can see up in the top one, you can see the uh, earlier in the night I had the Big Dipper in it. But I just wanted to show you all of the ones going back to Arcturus. You can't see Arcturus because of the clouds. Okay. What was interesting is that since we uh, there's 500 cameras now all across the world, and our information is being sent directly to NASA now to update their satellite uh, damage so they can uh, redo it. And since since this was done, uh, they've decided that there may be another peak, because usually this gives maybe one or two stars an hour, and at its peak it was about 45. But, uh, they think now at the end of this month, it may give another big burst okay. from the information they got. So uh, they haven't given us a date as such. They just said, keep your cameras on, which we do anyway. But I thought cool. that was interesting. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, John and Andrew Petal got one here. Is John here? Yeah, I'm right here. Oh, there you are. I hear you. Yeah. yeah, we spent about a half an hour or 45 minutes outside that night hoping to see a possible outburst. But uh, we only saw like two or three in that time. And that, that one in that picture there, we didn't even actually see. So that's when we looked through our photos later that we saw it. Yeah. Okay, very good. It was scattered yeah. cloud, right? Yeah, and it got worse like as the night went on too. Yeah, as you can tell. Yeah. And here's another um, one by John. Uh, so this was over a few nights, I guess. And, you know, really nice detail mm -hmm. there in, in M82. Yeah. You want to say anything about that one, John? You, you must be muted, John. That I am. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we are. Yeah, I just got over three hours. That was my first long um, stacked exposures. He's got that okay. dreaded, dreaded word DSS there. Don't let Robert see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really nice with a, and that's an unmodified camera. That's an unmodified. Yeah, I I forgot to, I forgot to uh, oh no I did put it in you had the filter UHC filter that was the only other thing that was in there okay You've got lots of nice red in there good yeah, yeah that's a great photo the, the breakup in the M eighty two and M eighty one the nice uh, out, outer cloud of the uh, galaxy yeah mm. nice yes very very nice I guess. On a good monitor, because mine's on a good monitor, that must be really something to see. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a good monitor. <laughs> There's more detail showing there. 
Oh yeah, but I mean, geez, I'm impressed with the detail actually. Yeah. Good. Um, so I did a shot of the moon, uh, June 4th, Robert did the moon June 6th. And so uh, Chris, I alluded to this earlier, has started an ambitious project to try and um, capture a planet. So Chris, you want to say a few words about where you are right now with that? Uh, uh, this is one of several fields I've found uh, through searching online during the day before, thinking it would be clear, go out to the telescope, manage to point, find the field, get set up, start taking exposures, and uh, it'll cloud over, or it, I don't know, this is the night when uh, I was hat, no, no, this is, uh, yeah, no, this is, this is a test we exposure go. before. Um, I actually got a sequence of, of exposures done, and and the target star turned out to be saturated in all of them. So it was a good practice run, but nothing useful. Um, but yeah, um, again, the uh, the new dome is the enabler for that because I don't need to worry about the telescope not being able to follow things through close to zenith, and a lot of these things go right overhead or close to that. So um, yay. Um, it's already helping me immensely. But this, uh, yeah, uh, what you're seeing here is a, just a stellarium plot on the right, showing, uh, zooming into the coordinates, uh, uh, Epoch 2000 coordinates. Stellarium normally presents coordinates in the, for the date, and it's 22 years after 2000. It makes a difference, believe it or not. And on the left is, uh, is an actual picture from the camera, from the finder camera, actually. And uh, you, the one thing I want to point out is nothing to do with exoplanets, but where, right where your pointer is, is a fuzzy blob. That's not the, the exoplanet or anything, but that is, uh, the crosshairs are more or less on top of where the exoplanet field of view is. That fuzzy blob, um, this fielder, this finder camera, I took the inside the block filter out, so it sees infrared. The optics are not made for infrared, so they don't focus it very well. So every time there's a big bright blob, to me, that says that there's something really infrared bright there. And one of these days, maybe I should look up just what that is. In this case, that star underneath the blob, if you look in the right, must be very bright in the infrared. Or okay. something. Cool. Well, good luck with your project. Thank you. And uh, Jim, here's the Elephant Trunk Nebula. A little more close up in this picture. Nice. Yeah, this is oh, oh wow, Randy. Oh. I'll mention what that is in a second of you. Okay. Not me. Hey, go ahead, Jim. Oh, it's uh, uh, this is uh, a recent attempt with my automated imaging setup. Uh, I left that let this go for overnight. Uh, uh, I guess this is on June seventh then. Um, and I was quite impressed with the data that I managed to gather. Uh, there's not a lot of astronomical nighttime available to us at this time of year. Um, but this is the, uh, this, this elephant trunk nebula is, uh, is probably the best data I've gotten on this particular object. And I'm hoping to get out tonight and get, get a few, uh, a couple more hours on this. And, uh, you can anyways. get a feel for the detail in this image just by looking at the, the crispness of the stars. Let me yeah. tell you, I zoomed in on this thing. I spent an afternoon, a part of an afternoon looking at this against uh, various astronomy photo of the day pictures and other posted pictures. That's a really good image, Jim. That's very sharp. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, I, was, I was very impressed as well. <laughs> so, is, is that a yeah. bunny rabbit on the left side there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's, on the left. It's sort of there. back. Yeah, up, mm -hmm. up, up. Oh, that's a teddy bear. There, you're on the ears. There's <laughs> and, and the stuffing. Uh, <laughs> just, just by way of comparison, here's a, a bit more zoomed in. Uh, this is Brent Denny's uh, photo, right? Oh, okay. yeah. So it's a little more zoomed in than yours, Jim. Yeah, Brent, Brent is a member in yeah. uh, Conception. He posts on Twitter, yeah. right? He doesn't post to the talk list as Dave Newbury does, but if you follow him on Twitter, you can find him. No. Yeah. Lacking, okay. And so Chris did um, M3. I guess you were working on your flats. 
Yeah, so. um, slight improvement. Uh, the big thing here was, you know, started at Arcturus. Arcturus has mentioned a few slides back, but now I can just go way up and uh, go up to M3 and yay, and actually get there without hitting dome. So it was nice to drink it in. Very good. So this is a, what, 22 half minute exposures. And uh, it, it brought enough up. Okay, and I think our last one, oh, I screwed up the uh, date here. I oh. copied, I didn't change that. But this was very recent, right, John? Yeah, that was uh, the 6th, 7th, and 9th or something, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, so the dates um, wrong. Yeah, the, so what's with the background? It's not as dark. That's what I was kind of wondering. It's like a different color, is it? Uh, I was kind of wondering what causes that. Hmm. I, I, I get that, too, so I'd be interested in... I think it, I, for me, I just think it's when I've got too much background light. But. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I got. For color cameras, only one in four pixels is filtered blue and one in four is filtered red. Um, I, I, it looks like a noise, electronic noise, like you're too close to the blue floor. Jim, if, if you want to say, I think in private communication, Jim, you have. Um, it's probably just a signal to noise thing. You just turn the, it put it into a, a program and turn down the blue channel black point a little bit towards the black a little bit to get rid of that. I would. Yeah. Nice okay. Image. Okay. Um, and I got a dust spot over there on the left. Straight. Ooh, yeah. I, ooh, I ooh, tried. Ooh. <laughs> well, there's a couple there, but you can kind of see that one more. And I cleaned it the other night, and I'm still getting them in the exact same spot. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know welcome where an image train is to. Welcome to, to the dust. <laughs> welcome it, to the dust bunny. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's the, the ones that you get that have legs that are really scary. No, okay. Yes. We don't count them in ones, right? So, Chris, you said the blue channel kind of turn it down a little bit. Yeah, just isolate the blue. I, th I think that'd be the first step. Yeah, in the, in the something. Head. There's a little galaxy down there. Looks like. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is cropped in a little bit, actually. Um, well, actually, a lot compared to what it was shot at, because I had the, the the netting. Is it that round circle around the outside squares of it? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a tough target. Good work. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, Mike, Mike, before we yeah. move on, if Mark is still there. Uh, I wanted to mention since yes, Mark, I am. Yep. Okay. One of the, one of the few people who ever looked through the Northcott scope, and uh, uh, yep. Mark's dad, Dr. John Pippi, was uh, a great supporter of our center early on. He kept us going for a long time. You, yeah, I I, I remember. You're privileged to have gone look through that thing. That was a beast to move. I couldn't fit yeah, it in I my know. car. Man, oh man. So. Uh, I was, yeah, when you. I did it last week, I went and got a trolley and put the mount in the telescope on the trolley. And then I had to get it down the elevator and out the front of the building. And that's not too bad. Yeah. And then I had to get it, the front of chemistry and physics has a wheelchair ramp. Yeah. And I feel sorry for anybody in a wheelchair because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of back and forth and when you go around one sort of the last corner before you come down to the sidewalk there's a little step down in the concrete and mm. the wheel fell one of the wheels fell off Ooh. the trolley Jeez. Oops. Yeah. So i had the telescope and the trolley and i was trying to hold that up and yeah. bend down and get the wheel and stick it back yeah back into the uh, socket that, that's solid brass the top part is all solid brass and yes it's sharp it's, as all get out if you have to hit your head out of it not ask probably. me how i know that <laughs> yeah uh, anyways so um robert do you have the sky this month or do you want me to bring it up you can bring it up i do have it but I'm too lazy <laughs> okay so we can't see it from robert so uh no, okay. I can see it here. Can everybody else yeah, see it? We, we can't see you, right? No, you can't see me. No, no. 
Are we sharing your screen? Did that just appear? No. Yeah. Yep. I see it there. Yeah. I don't think I'll be able to scroll it. So. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, June, July, um, and on the front we can see the uh, solar system roundup as per usual. The sunset and sunrise. Uh, note: 16 hours and one minute of uh, daylight yeah. now, so it's yeah. a bit tougher for uh, astronomy, but uh, it's a bit lighter, or not lighter, I'm sorry, a bit warmer this time of year, so yeah, right. we'll take a little, <laughs> little bit of one on the other. Uh, and the bugs like that. Well, yeah. Here we uh, can see the uh, rise time and, uh, set and crosses the meridian, uh, uh, for the planets, and uh, I think uh, Mercury uh, has the best viewing tomorrow morning uh, for um, for the next six yeah. months or so, something it's like that. Elongation at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, about Maybe nine so. or ten degrees or something above the horizon, uh, yeah. just before sunrise. Yeah. So, uh, and that's I'm, a pretty small window. Yeah. Because it. <clears throat> it comes up and then it gets light pretty quickly. Yeah. Pretty quickly, yeah. Uh, and so the solar disk of the sun is uh, sporting a few spots. So uh, for those with uh, an astronomical uh, solar um, filtered uh, image, whether or not you have uh, the uh, ability to see prominences or not, still there's uh, some uh, nice sunspots. And I guess if you uh, wanted to, you could uh, get some close-up images of some of these sunspots. Uh, I think it's been a while since uh, anyone's really gotten much of that. So uh, something to look forward to. Morning planets, as mentioned, uh, of course, uh, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mercury. So they're is all anyone, in the... Is anyone actively imaging Venus? Have you noticed uh, an article recently? There's a, Not that there's, I've noticed. There's a, band, no, I there's a dark band appeared in the middle of the cloud bank. Oh, is that right? Uh, I think you need is, a fairly, this, fairly is, large magnification. To see this it. Uh, Just the last originally second. first started back in 86 was first observed. Mm -hmm. And then the Japanese or the last visa thing mentioned it. And they've been uh, studying it uh, lately. But you need an infrared uh, filter. Okay to actually pick it up in your camera. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so oh. it's about Bernard, 500 Bernard kilometers a, long Bernard, or something. Bernard and I have a, this, the little blue um, QHY planetary camera is very infrared sensitive. That would be a dandy little camera. If uh, anyone out there wanted to image Venus. That's a good idea. Um, okay, and moving on. Uh, Comets, there's not a lot of any particular renown at the uh, moment, and uh, asteroids, as uh, shown there, some of them are fairly bright, so you could get a, a look at it, but the trick with asteroids is to get any satisfaction out of it, you got to go out and see them uh, night after night, which is a, a difficult thing in our province, but you'd see them change their position on the background of the sky. Okay. Um, meteor showers, uh, I don't think we have much to look forward to right now until uh, the um, August, the, uh, August, the um, oh, Leonids. Uh, where am I? Yeah, I tell you, that's, uh, that's an age related uh, 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 loss of faculty. <laughs> <laughs> Having a senior's moment, are you? A senior's moment, yeah. Blame it on COVID, but blame it on COVID. <laughs> right. Yeah, Brain. and uh, we have our deep sky objects for June and July, and our binocular objects there, uh, which are, you know, particular objects that are well placed for the time of year and that's why they that's why we showed them right and so one one has got to be pretty dark yeah so and if you have a smaller you know uh, a smaller scope then you know it helps to know what some of the better 
objects for the time of year is. So that's why you see these, these objects here month after month. And uh, Messier Marathon is a possible uh, summer observing challenge between now and our next next meeting is September 21st. Observe as many Messier objects as possible and keep track of how many you have confirmed. So you need to have uh, like a notebook or something to, uh, to do that with. And uh, the observations can be with binoculars or a scope and uh, can be either visual or photographic. So that's the challenge for over the summer. Okay. And uh, International Space Station happenings across the uh, sky. So you can uh, look this up in uh, in the tabular form to see when it is that you'd be able to see them and uh, how bright uh, the passages would be. Yeah. That's next month, right? Yep. Looks pretty early. Yep, four o'clock, five o'clock, three o'clock, yeah. one o'clock, two o'clock, yeah. all early morning, yeah. Okay, they're gonna have to take care of themselves then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're daytime at the moment. They might try catching them on, a, on the transit. On the transit? Uh, going, from, going from the sun. Oh, Whatever. yeah. Well, that's, a, yeah, that, that would be uh, kind of neat. Uh, it's been done before. It's, it's been photographed list. before. It's on my bucket See, list. Again, Randy? It's on my bucket it's list. It's on your bucket list, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, observing session. Uh, unfortunately cancelled uh, due to COVID-19 at the at the moment, but um, things can change. Let's just yeah. say so. We'll uh, yeah. stay tuned, and we'll see. Yeah, uh, we we all thought COVID was over, but uh, I can assure you it wasn't quite. <laughs> and I think Chris, yeah, Chris's friends can assure you of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed I don't have it. I tested again. I tested negative again today, and I'm I'm feeling fine. But at least four people within ten feet of me all have it right now. I was in the middle of a of a bubble of COVID infection on the stage up there. So, yeah, um, I guess the, my mask was new and sealed properly. I guess. Yeah. Um. You never know. Just crush fingers and, and and try to stay as as clean as you can and observant as you can. You know because you it's it's all around. Uh, observing calendar for June and July, just showing the phases of the moon and uh, the uh, monthly meeting times. Uh, that would be, uh, and of course, for July we don't have a monthly meeting as you can see there. Um, and the uh, July 30th, what's that? Meteor shower. A meteor That's, shower, but it must be a small one. Yeah, well, or it's misplaced. Uh, uh, it should be the 13th, 12th, but 13th. It's August. that one there. It's the Delta. The Delta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. You see about 10. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, you see about yeah. 10 an hour. Delta clear. Yeah. yeah. I'll wait for the person. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, Jeff. Robert. You're welcome. So let's see if I can uh, have to uh, steal it back. Uh, there we are. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> there's the news is no news. Um, have a good summer. Um, the next meeting, we're hoping we can be in uh, C2045, it'll be September 21st. Um, and, we'll and see so, how COVID goes in the and on Zoom And on Zoom as well. Yep. Yeah, so we're going to try and figure out some way to have a hybrid meeting. So we got lots of smart people who are going to figure that out. Yeah, I may too. Tell me how to do it. <laughs> um, and I, we're going to have to watch how COVID evolves but i think the, the the latest announcements was that hospitalizations went up and uh cases went up and mm -hmm. there does seem to be quite a bit on the go right now so yeah. um we want to be a little bit careful my but age, uh, my, it's certainly be nice group. if we yeah. have some events over the summer 
Yeah. So stay tuned and we'll send out announcements. Yeah. Uh, Randy? Yeah, it's, uh, we'll, we're going to hope for a uh, uh, Butterpot barbecue. It'll be, if we have one, uh, a quite smaller event, maybe just one, 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 one event, and just do maybe the barbecue and a bit of observing, but uh, not the two day affair like we've had before. Yeah. If, if we On get the to Saturday. That. Well, yeah, we'll see what the weather holds. Uh, well, yeah, true. It is uh, uh, already scheduled from the uh, yeah. Yeah. butter pot point of view, but um, we'll, had, we'll see. Uh, I had a query from someone wanting to know if we were planning an observing event for the seven planets. And uh, when I said, well, <laughs> it's uh, pretty close to sunrise, they weren't interested. <laughs> uh, yeah. There we go. Is there any word about the Terra Nova star party? Uh, not wow. yet. Um, it's not going to happen. Doug Grushi has gotten back in touch with Dave Saunders, and he was he was, was off right now and was going to get back in touch with Doug um, when he came back to work, which should be hopefully soon. So we're still waiting to hear from them. I think it's getting a bit late to... Uh... To be planning something like that now. It's uh, yeah, only, what, about a month from now. Now they may still have their own their own thing. We we just won't be involved. Perhaps I don't. Yeah, or if we're involved, we may be involved just as individuals. Or you know, you if they have something, we are allowed to go. Uh, does the REC provide gas vouchers? <laughs> <laughs> I know you have, have to ask the secretary about that. Right, sure. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, Let's gas see. is a problem yeah. too. Yeah. Okay, so um, are there any, if there's anyone that's got new equipment or other things they want to talk about otherwise, I think the formal part of the meeting's over. Uh, so I'll wish everybody a good summer and uh, stay safe. And uh, from, from those of us, there's a few of us with experience if you could avoid getting COVID, I would strongly recommend that. Yeah. It's, I'll uh, totally agree with you there for some strange it's reason. Not, it's not nearly as much fun as they make it sound. We have, we have another executive member who has COVID. So, uh, oh. I, I would oh, say. Dear. So. Okay. okay. Um, just a reminder, the RASC NL talk list is active still through the summer. That's oh, probably uh, a good place. To did get. I mention uh, if you're if you're signed up for the GA? Now the AGM is separate; that's free and online. But the GA is having a an astro photo contest for people registered for the GA, so you can submit photos. I, I really think some of you guys should be submitting your pictures. Yep, I think I can think of a few that uh, should go in, and, and it's twenty bucks. I mean, that's Peanuts. hard to beat. Yeah. So. Yep, absolutely. I'm okay, well, right now. <laughs> uh, that was well, in, folks, uh, thank you. I think that was in yesterday's uh, or Monday's uh, bulletin or the monthly thing that comes out from the, uh, from the okay, So, Jimmy Atlanta say, uh, have a good summer and uh, Mm -hmm. Jamie Kenny said, thanks. Enjoy the summer. See you again soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, keep me informed uh, about your uh, exoplanets. I may try some. So if you, yep. you know, if you say the date, give me a chance. Email me sure. and uh, with the information. Well, I'll almost certainly just keep writing to the area. So the, the talk list. list. So yep. absolutely. So uh, yeah, Peggy, you we're, enjoy the summer. We'll be in touch about your observatory, etc. I'm sure. So Peggy mm -hmm. just got back. Hi, Peggy. We're yes. sort okay. of wrapping things up, but oh, I will do. Thank you. I'll keep you all in the loop. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, good time. Bye, Susan. Sorry. Mark. Yes, thanks for thanks for your remembrances, Mark. That was a, that was great. 
Yes, thank you. Well, I'm wondering if it's still clear outside. Yeah, moon will be up. It looks like you're from here. Moon I got my. I can see the North Shore Conception Bay from here. Oh, well, that's good. I have to inject I'm... myself lots of caffeine. I'm... It was a beautiful <laughs> full moon the other night in the fog. Must say, Cynthia yeah. and I are going out to Butter Pot Friday night. We're going to do something with the Pathfinders since we're now invulnerable for a couple of weeks. <laughs>